Hey, it's David Levin. Welcome to our Ask Them Yourself Celebrity Zoom Party, where you ask the questions face to face. And today I'm very excited because our guest is comedian, writer, actor, Robert Wool, best known for parts in Batman, Bull Durham, Good Morning Vietnam, and for creating the memorable HBO series and character, Arliss. He'll be talking about all those and more. Plus, we'll have a surprise guest pop in, Don Most of Happy Days. Before we get started, I want to remind you that you can get invitations to be on future Celebrity Zooms with a chance to talk face-to-face with the stars by becoming a Patreon member of Pop Goes to Culture TV. And if you're not ready to pull the trigger on membership, you can always watch future episodes by subscribing to our channel. And if you ring that bell, we'll let you know every single time we upload a new video. And now, let's dive right into today's Celebrity Zoom with the brilliant Robert Wool. Hello, everybody. Welcome to our Zoom conference with uh, our, our party with, uh, with, with Robert Wool. Thanks for coming. Uh, those of you who have been with us before know that these are fun and a little bit unpredictable, and we never know how they're going to run. Um, but, you know, we're going we're gonna to dive right in and, um, and see if anybody has any questions. If you have a question, uh, just put on the, on the um, there's a little thing that says, raise your hand or wave or, <laughs> or wave. Oh, this is uh, going to be a short hour. Well, we got, we got Andy, but that's Sue. So I know, so it says Andy. So Sue, why don't you, uh, do you, why don't you get the ball rolling and say, say hi to Robert. Hi, Robert. I'm Susan, and I'm a friend of David's and a fan of yours. That's nice. Why does it say Andy Russ? Here comes Andy Russ. Okay. Oh, where am I? Hello. <laughs> okay, fair enough. Two okay. Well, I appreciate you. I appreciate you coming on. So, guys, what do you? Uh, what would you like to talk about today? Any Any questions for Robert? Go ahead. Start. Um, well, no, I mean, basically, uh, oh, a yeah, huge fan. Forget about uh, Hollywood Nights, New Bomb Turk. Saw it a thousand times. Wore out my VHS. Amazing. That's when I became a huge fan. Um, but then when I saw you on, uh, when you did that, um, what was it called? Uh, Assume the Position. Yes. Yeah. Amazing. That's when I realized you were also a genius. I mean, are you it that took, smart? It took you that long. Yeah. <laughs> no, um, I enjoyed doing, actually both of them. Hollywood Nights is my first movie. In fact, I get stopped outside of, I'd say, Batman, of course, and uh, probably the TV series. I get stopped more for Hollywood Nights than anything else I've ever done. Uh, people, it's a cult film. Um, and what happened is that when it came out around 19, eh, 1980, uh, it did okay at the box office. It wasn't a huge hit, but what happened was it was one of the first movies in the rotation at HBO. And what happened is they would, you know, like back then they would show the movie like 15 times a day. So, uh, and, and it was one of those movies that fathers I found out watched with their sons and they could laugh together. And what's happened since then, because it's now 40 years old, is that uh, two generations have grown up and their fathers and their grandfathers watch it with the kids. So that goes on. But to this day, I mean, great talent in that movie. It was my first film, Tony Danza's first film, Michelle Pfeiffer's first film, uh, Stuart Pankin, Fran Drescher. I mean, great talent is in that movie. Uh, so as far as I, as far as assume the position, that was after I finished Arliss, I went to uh, the head of HBO and I said, I got this wild hair. I don't know what it is, but I'd like to do like a history class, but make it entertaining and do it in, in front of the real college audience. So we did it in front of NYU students, did two of them, and they were very, very well, it's probably the most well-received thing I've ever done. But then again, the HBO uh, hierarchy turned over about that time, and uh, they didn't want much to do with anything that the previous a hierarchy, you know, had done for the most part, and I was on. That was me. <laughs> could you do that? Could you do that as a live, like a tour? I mean, couldn't you do something? I like did that? those shows live uh, in front of real students. I did tour with a version of it later. At, uh, later, after the two shows, uh, I did tour with it later, and we had a third one ready to go, but everything fell apart. Mm, that's a shame. I heard Thank your you. name come up the other day on the radio too. I was listening to uh, Craig Carton. Of course, and he, and he was coming up with something that was wrong, and he comes back after the commercial and says, uh, "Robert Wall called and corrected me." <laughs> so oh, that was about the Mona Lisa, I think. Yes, that's what it was. Yeah, yeah. yeah. 
so I'm, I'm looking behind you, Andy. I don't know if you can see it, Robert, but I'm seeing what looks like an original Bob Kane of Batman and Robin. I, that is Robert, do you have any connection to Batman in any way that we that we might? Uh... I, don't, I don't know. I don't know if an original Bob Kane is behind me here. No, there's no behind uh, Andy. Oh, yeah. it's behind Andy. Oh, behind Andy. I'm sorry. Uh, Bob Kane came. I, I met him one time. I met him one time. That was it. Uh, it was great fun. I mean, uh, uh, you know, Batman's Batman. I mean, the well, I'll t my experience on Batman is so it's a big story. Uh, but the thing about it is that every superhero director and movies and everything, uh, they should all give a royalty to Tim Burton because that's what started. I mean, before that, it was, you know, nothing. I mean, Tim Burton was the genius behind the whole thing. I mean, every, like I said, everybody should owe a royalty to him um, because it was all his vision. It was totally his, it wasn't, it certainly wasn't Goober's and Peter's version. You know, people forget, people forget, uh, unless you're of a certain age, how much of a backlash there was to the casting of Michael Keaton as Batman. If there had been social media back then, I don't think he would have survived. I don't think, <laughs> I know that's that's not a joke. I don't think I, I agree know. with you. I, agree. I don't think the studio would have now. What people don't understand is that the people who had the backlash were the diehard Dark Knight type of gothic comic books type of thing, you know, because Goober and Peters, the producers, they they didn't see the dark that Tim Burton did. Because I once asked, uh, I forgot which one it was. I go, if you hadn't gotten Michael Keaton. Who did you want to cast as Batman? And do you know who their answers were? Bill Murray or Chevy Chase. So they were not going in the direction that Tim Burton was. Tim was going darker. They want, in fact, they got rid of Tim Burton because they thought he went too dark, which we can already make a case for with the second movie. But uh, but no, they weren't thinking that. They wanted bang zoom Batman, which which is funny because you know, to me, I did not like the Adam West series. And and, and in, it's interesting that. To today's generation, they kind kind of look at the Jack Nicholson Batman the way I look at Adam West Batman. It's interesting, interesting. it is because they they don't want the jokey. They want it darker and darker and darker. That's just a generational thing. Everything is dark. I just read today that the new Batman with Pattinson is three hours long, which is absurd. But uh, uh, the thing is, as dark as you know, they're a different animal. The Batman. Uh, the uh, Christopher Nolan Batman series. It's a different animal. You have to judge them in a different way. I look at it this way. I, I, in my opinion, in the first sequence of Batman's, and I'll take, I'm talking about the Tim Burton through the Joel Schumacher stuff. If you put them end to end together, the five movies, I would suggest that every hour gets progressively worse. Uh, I mean, until they're unwatchable. Yeah, that's that's that that version now. And then this generation, it's a whole darker thing. The only thing I will say about the Tim Burton movies, at least the first one anyway, there was still a sense of fun. I mean, Jack is fun. He's funny. He's making jokes. It's fun. He had the Prince music. It's fun. I, I, unless you have to have a different gener a different definition. But I don't find the Dark Knight, as good as they are, fun uh, in the same sense. But then again, fun takes on a different uh, 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 takes on a different level. Uh, uh, each generation. Could you hold off for one second? I don't know who sure, you are. Sure, no problem. Hello? Hello? Bad time. Bad time. Uh, I'm on a podcast live. I uh, love live, don't you? How do you see how you rate it? Anything can happen. I got, a, I got a water leak between me and the next door neighbor or something like that. So oh, we're trying gosh. To out with the plumbers. I'm sorry. I'm no, sorry. No, that's always, we, we, we had room for a commercial break. So uh, we okay, made good. a fortune during that, during that couple of good, seconds. Good, good. That was, uh, that was great. Um, let's see, you know, this, this normally I would love to be asking you questions, but this is about other people. So who, who else would like to, uh, to put up their hand and ask a question? Anybody? Yes, Sam, Sam Viviano. Okay, first of all, Robert, before, before Sam answers, I wanna introduce you to Sam. Sam was the art director of Mad Magazine for years, and he is the one, the gentleman who is working on our viral vignettes poster. 
Well, thank you, Sam. I appreciate the work. He's thank an, you. He's an amazing guy. So, Sam, say hi. Hello. Uh, you can hear me okay? Yes. Okay. Um, you were talking about Hollywood Nights and, and the uh, amazing talent that was in that film. Uh, I want to ask about another, maybe a little even more cult film that you were in that had some other decent actors and it was called Mistress. Uh, bless you. Bless you. I, I actually have a great deal of fondness for that movie. Uh, as do I. It's the best performance I ever gave in my life. And that's all due to Barry Primus, the writer director. Uh, you know, that was Tribeca's first film. That was Tribeca's first film. And Barry was, you know, uh, you know, De Niro's best friend and acting coach, uh, sort of, and everything. So uh, so they, when he cast me in this movie, and I mean, the people I am surrounded by in every scene, whether it's Martin Landau, may he rest in peace, I love him. Uh, you know, you had uh, Danny Aiello, De Niro, Eli Wallach, Christopher Walken, Gene Smart, Cheryl Lee Ralph, Laurie Metcalf. I, it's, I, you know, I pitched myself every day and I became a better actor because of that. Uh, but yeah, it's, and it's funny because when I talk to film students, the movie they, besides back, the film that most film students, Alexander Payne and all these guys who came out of that, want to talk about is Mistress. Uh, yeah. Mostly because that's going to be their experience. Right. You know, trying to get a movie made independently and having all these guys, you know, want their mistress or some string attached to it. Uh, I, I love it. I love the movie. Um, like I said, it's the best thing. It made no money. <laughs> uh, it was, uh, but... That's the movie that I'm closest, uh, sort of, as far as performance wise, it's the best work I did by far. And that's all because of Barry. Mm. He, he was on top of me. He, he beat me up pretty good. And well, it, was a great, it was a terrific performance and you definitely held your own against those minor talents you mentioned. Yeah, Martin Landau and I, because we were in every scene together pretty much. Right. It, was, uh, it was a fondness that I'll never remember. But listen, Mar I got into the Academy because Martin Landau and Robert De Niro signed my card and sponsored me. That's the reason I'm in, um, but they were one. And Martin, Marty, you know, for, besides being the greatest mimic I've ever met, he's great, a great mimic, and the stories Marty had. I mean, you know, Actors Studio, and his buddy was James Dean, you know, they were running around together. He'd, he'd bring out the album, and the two of them would hang out together from New York and LA. Uh, just great stories, Martin Landau, wow. I miss him. He was, he was amazing, and especially towards the end of his career, when, you know, most people thought of him in Space 1999 or, or, um, or, or Mission Impossible, but towards the end of his career, you know, with, with um, the Coen Brothers and some of the other stuff that he did, it just, just amazing stuff playing, um, um, brain just went blind, like playing Bela Lugosi. Yeah, know? I mean, and, his career, his career had a huge second act. First, the things that jumped him off of was Coppola when he was in uh, Tucker, mm -hmm. and then Woody, uh, yep. put him in Crimes and Misdemeanors. And that performance is, that well, that's my one of my favorite movies. I mean, uh, I guess it's very un-PC to talk about Woody these days as a filmmaker, but I don't give a shit. Uh, uh, you know, it's like, uh, you know, Woody was a huge influence on me and a huge influence on film in America, you know, in the letter part of, of, of the, you know, millennium. But he yeah. was, uh, and of course, Ed Wood. Ed Wood came after that, and yep. then uh, Marty special. Marty was so special. Uh, Seth has his hand up. Seth, hey, Robert, Robert. nice to meet you. Nice to hey, meet Robert, you. Hey, Robert, great to meet you. Pleasure. Uh, by the way, I, I just saw uh, Martin in, I just watched Rounders. Uh, yes, yes. With Matt Dean. He was so great in that. He Always. really, really was. Always. Fantastic. Fantastic. Great cartoonist, great cartoonist, because he started out in newspapers as a cartoonist. Great right. mimic. Boy, could he, could he, uh, he had, nobody had better stories than Martin Landau. No. That's, that's great. Uh, oh, so my question was, I'm, I just started reading um, uh, this new book about the history of HBO. Um, and I'm just getting into it. It's actually really, really interesting. Yes. And we haven't gotten up to our, our list yet, but I would love to hear no. sort of what it was like uh, starting, start. You were one of the first series there that really uh, kind of launched them into scripted, and I wanted to get get a, a sense of what that was like when you started there. Well, our, our list, let me go back. It wasn't, you know, we were in the beginning. It wasn't, you know, going back. They had stuff like First and Ten, 
And they did have other series, not necessarily the news. And they had other series. In fact, they had, you know, Gary Shanda, they had um, uh, Larry Sanders was before that, as was a, 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 a Dream On was before then. So they had series. And then we were the next wave. We, I came like, I was the first one of the wave, the Albrecht wave which was basically Arliss and then Sex and the City, then The Sopranos and The Wire uh, and Six Feet Under. So we was, I was the next wave there. What it was, it was great. As far as the work, because I had no, I could do anything I wanted. Chris had first put me on stage, by the way, in, when he was the manager of the improv in New York and I started out as a comic. So he was the guy who brought me on stage and I was his go-to guy. So he knew he could trust me, especially financially. The one thing I'm very proud of is, uh, uh, see, my father was a businessman. We, I come from a family business. And so I brought in every episode on time and on budget and under budget, which was unheard of in HBO. When you do, you ask what the Sopranos and Sex in the City and all those shows went over budget on, or they were going to London. Uh, but uh, it was great fun. Now, Chris was not a sports fan either. Uh, but he said, I don't know sports, but I, I, I think I know it's funny. And then we took made it funny. And then we took it to a different level with the social issues which people forget about until now when they get back to second, because we were doing shows about gay athletes and transgender athletes and, and uh, domestic abuse and steroids and, uh, uh, you know, and, and transgender athletes and alcoholism and, and Alzheimer's. We were doing all the and unwanted pregnancies and people watch it now and go, wow, you were so ahead of your time. And I always say, well, yeah, I, I, I hate that term. I would have much rather been of my time and have Seinfeld money. But, you know, uh, but yeah, we did, dealt with these issues. And then again, when I watched, and I had not watched them in like 15, 18 years until we had to stream them. And then we had to clear stuff. And, uh, and also I had this, uh, I had this, you know, I picked, I got lucky with one of my, uh, I, one of my cast members, because nobody wanted her, but I wanted this girl called Sandra O oh to play my assistant. And so, um, that turned out pretty well. That's great. Awesome. She's, she's, she's done pretty well for herself, that Sandra O. Oh. Yes. Well, she's a good actress. She's Have a, you seen The Chair? No. Uh, really good. San, Sandra O oh playing in The Chair. I'm really. not surprised. Yeah. Yeah. She's really, she's quite amazing. Um, let's see who else wants to uh, put up their hand. Ed Barrenhouse, say hello. Hey, Robert. What a great pleasure to meet you. My pleasure, Ed. Thank you for coming. Sure. Uh, so talking more about our list, do you feel that you, if you were to continue that show today, what would, what would he be up to? What would he be doing today? Um, well, um, I, I don't think much would change. Maybe he'd be part of a bigger firm. That would, I mean, cause all these conglomerates buy up or everything. To me, it was always just a guy doing a job. I mean, he had a very, he was a guy who had a business doing a job. He had a very unique clientele. Like I said, I come from a family business. So I knew how business worked as far as what decisions are going to be made. And it's and it wasn't PC. Uh, it was like everybody was, when we read in the writer's room, they'd say, oh, can he do this? And I go, no, because that's not real. Uh, I'll give you an example. We did a show about a scab ball player when they, when they had the replacement ball players. So, and this one guy was a replacement ball player, like Kevin Millar was. I don't know if you know baseball, but uh, Kevin Millar was a replacement player. And what happened was Arliss, who represented big athletes, represented a lot of the leaders of the Players Association, you know, like a Roger Clemens or like, you know, the big stars. And they were very, very anti, you know, anti scam. So in the story, Arliss is saved his car catches on fire and he's locked inside and he's saved by a scab ball player, by a replacement player. And I, I go to thank him and I said, what can I do for you? He goes, well, I'd like you to represent me. And of course, I had, Arliss had to deal with that. And everybody in, in the room would always say, oh, you got to represent him. And I said, absolutely not. He would lose all his, he'd lose his clientele. That's not, that's Hollywood. That's not real in business. He would lose his ball players. And now what he does do is he gets him an agent, which turned out to be Shelley Berman in a very funny episode. But there's no way. That's not real. That's Hollywood bullshit. He's not going to lose his entire practice and his biggest clients to represent a guy making no money because it's, it feels good in his heart. Not going to happen. So, I mean, I was proud of that. And so, you know, I knew, you know, I knew about running a business. To me, it was a guy doing a job. 
You know, it's like there's a lot of a lot of you in the character. How much of the character is actually a part, an extension of you at this point? Oh, you I would say. Well, I mean, when it came to that, like I said, um, like I said, he was running a business, and and so that part of it, it was me. I mean, the heart part is also me. Yeah, hopefully. Um, I mean, quite a bit, but Arliss more than anything else I did for sure. Well, I created it. Yeah. So that was the story and it was, it was easy and we dealt with character. And um, yeah, I would say, uh, you know, quite a bit of that. It was funny, I would always go to, uh, one time I was at the uh, Tribeca Film Festival uh, Vanity Fair opening party and Fran Leibowitz came up to me, chain smoked and said, I hate sports, but I love your show. And I, and I told her it's not about sports. It's about characters in the world of sports. And that's totally different. That's totally different. It's not about a big game. I don't give a shit about a big game. As Ron Shelton used to say, there aren't no big games. That's what it was. The problem with most sports, if we're talking about sports, most sports movies and stories is they're always told from the point of view of the fan. And the fan only gives a shit about one thing. Did the team win or lose? The good sports projects aren't told from the point of view of the fan. They're told from the point of view of the guy who is in the arena in some way. And he's not thinking, uh, you know, about what I, what he's thinking is I'm trying to keep my job. And that's what I, you know, would, would lean to. Thanks. Yeah. You are, you are a big sports fan. I mean, I'm thinking about Bull Durham. What was it like to be? In I was cast in Bull Durham. Yeah, I, I do love base, baseball, especially. But I, it wasn't because, I, I mean, nobody knew I was a sports fan then. I mean, Ron Shelton uh, cast me after giving what he said was the worst audition in the history that he ever saw. And he said, that was the worst audition I ever saw. Hire him immediately because he's going to add something that I need. So uh, so that was kind of Ron. <laughs> what, what was it that he wanted you to, to add? What do you think? When I went for the audition, now the character of Larry Hockett, the pitching coach in Bull Durham, I don't think he's got six lines in the entire script. But so I was trying to find a hook to, for my character. And I just done Good Morning Vietnam. And my acting guru at the time was the great, 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 very great Bruno Kirby. And I called Bruno and I said, Bruno, I, I, I don't, I don't get a hook on this guy. And he said, well, he's the pitching coach. I go, yeah. I go, he's the pitching coach with the manager, and that is the only staff member he's got. It's the manager has a pitching coach in the minor leagues. That was it back then. And he said, it would seem to me that if the manager go, succeeds, he's going to take the pitching coach with him. That's his guy. So then it hit me, okay, he's a yes man. He's a yes man. That's all I had to know. So my dad did play uh, baseball. And so I got all the patter from him, the uh, come better, no better, better, no better here. Come, come, come on, baby, come, baby, no better. I got it. You take it, let it go. So I, I went into the, <laughs> into the audition and I added all that stuff. I just, you know, they, they'd ask a question. I go, that's right, Skip. You got it, Skip. No better here. No better. So like I said, I was all over. And Ron said afterwards when I left the room and the casting director apologized for bringing me in. He said, hire him immediately. And she couldn't believe it. He goes, he is going to add an energy. And whenever I get in trouble during a scene, I can cut to him. And, uh, you know, little did we know what was going to happen. And then Ron let me play. And, of course, the best thing that came out of it was me Ed, living the scene on the mound with the candlesticks. So that's because of my wife. <laughs> so, uh, so, I mean, that's what happened. That's amazing. That's amazing. Well, does somebody else have a question? Because I can continue asking, but I would, I, I really want to give you guys Please, a chance. Anybody. anybody. Ashley, you're usually good for a question. You have to, Ashley's turn to, Ashley is a regular on these meetings well, now, and, and I really appreciate the fact that she shows up for these. Ashley, you got something to, to ask Robert? Well, I have a friend who's a big fan, so I actually asked him if he had one, and he's still thinking. So in the meantime, I was wondering, what can you tell us about when you were on game shows? I saw on your Wikipedia page that you were on the $10,000 pyramid. I used to love game shows. Can you give me any inside baseball on what it's well, like to sure. be on those shows? Sure. Well, I was in college and, uh, you know, back in college, I, we, you know, we were, we'd sit around and watch during the day. If you're in the theater department or you're doing something there, you, you know, you got the days all free. So we'd watch uh, the $10,000 pyramid, which it was mm -hmm. back. 
And uh, I always said, I, I think I can beat, I, I could win this game. I could win this game. And uh, so I, when I moved back home to New Jersey, in New York, and I started doing stand-up comedy, I applied to be a contestant on the $10,000 pyramid. And they would put you through trial shows. Now, here's just uh, whoever this person was that passed me on the first round, I owe a lot to because I was paired with somebody who had a speech impediment. Oh. And not unlike Michael uh, Palin in The Fish Called Wanda. And I'm sitting there giving clues and waiting and I'm, you know, I, I don't, you know, and I, you know, it breaks your heart, but this is not the guy you want to be your partner. You know, it's, it's like he's stuttering, you know, and so I didn't think I was going to get past that first round. After I got past the first round of auditions, I did pretty good. I was pretty, I, I, you know, I didn't miss too much. So I felt good about that. And I always said, thought that if I got to the finals, that I would give the clues. And yet when I got to the finals, my partner was Sandy Duncan. I decided, oh, yeah. I decided to sit in the chair and, and be the recipient, which worked out great. But because uh, I, I, I did really well. I got all 21 questions, 21 out of 21, which they gave you an extra thousand, shows you how different the money was there. Gave you an extra thousand dollars for. And then I got through the pyramid and I won 10 grand, but they don't give you that other thousand dollars if you won the 20,000, if you won the $10,000 pyramid. And you didn't go on back then. So, uh, and then that's, that's that part. The other part of the game show is the dating game. Now, when I moved out to Hollywood as a comic, comedian, you supported yourself by going on game shows because they oh, paid. They, oh. they were union scale pay. You'll see so many actors back then. You'll see P, uh, Paul Rubens, Tom Selleck, mm -hmm. me, Andy Kaufman. Uh, you'll see a lot of that. And it paid. So I would go on, you know, it would pay my rent every month. So I would go on once every other month under a different character's name. And uh, they liked and they liked having comics because you know they were self-contained and they could do funny, so that's why I was on the on the, uh, the dating game and I won a couple of times. That's cool. My uh, friend Craig, who said he's a big fan of yours, he asked me to say he said he was on one of my favorite episodes of Tales from the Crypt. It was directed by Richard Donner, one of my favorite directors. What was it like working working with Richard Donner and Tim Burton? Also, tell him I've been a fan of his forever. Thank you. Uh, Dick Donner was the greatest. Dick Donner, he, he would, another great storyteller. Uh, you know, Dick Donner used to direct episodes of Wanted Dead or Alive and all that great stuff back then, uh, Bonanza, and he would tell stories. But the great thing about Dick Donner was two things. Number one, he never had your name right. He'd always say, uh, Jimmy, Jackie, Joey, Bob, Johnny, Bob, Bobby, Bob, Robert. Uh, listen, and the other thing was he would talk while you were acting. I mean, old school, he would say, okay. And he's like a big panning shot. He says, the camera's going around and it's coming in and it's coming through. Okay, go. I mean, it's like that. So, uh, and I had a blast. What happened was I just finished back shooting Batman and Marion Dougherty, who was the great grand dame of casting directors and started the whole business of casting director, uh, was doing this thing for Dick Donner and the guys from Tales of the Crypt. It was the first episode. It was the first of the three episodes when they came back on. It was... Uh, it was, uh, I forgot who was, it, it was uh, Walter Hill, Zemeckis, and Donner. They directed the three episodes. And uh, so it was the first batch, and I was with Joey Pants and Joey Pantoliano, and we, we had a scene where we could not stop laughing. We broke each other up, and it went about 20 takes, and even Donner started cracking up. Uh, well, we've got through it, and we were both nominated, Joey Pants and I were both nominated for Cable Ace Awards for Best Drama, Best Actor in a Drama that year. Neither of us won. But that was great fun. I mean, uh, Tales from the Crypt, what a great time. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Ah, the Cable Ace Awards. I remember them well. Yeah. <laughs> um, anybody else want to take a shot? Ah, we got Jonathan. Jonathan, say hi to Robert. Robert hey, Robert, how are you doing? Jonathan, how are you? Good. I was just wondering, um, did you ever, with our list, did you ever like, pick the brains of, of like agents and uh, or like athletes just to kind of get stories, ideas, and things of, of that nature? Of course, of course. Yeah, I talked to a lot of agents. We, that's, you know, I picked the brains of all. And not just, by the way, not just sports agents. You know, theatrical agents, real estate agents, travel agents, they're agents. 
agent of all kinds, because they all have a basic thing in common is they're getting a percentage of what their client is doing. So again, it goes back to, and, and it goes back to a guy running a business. Uh, we did a show one time about a client who wasn't paying commission checks. And I said, that's a great story. That's real. That is absolutely real, these guys. And I would hear stories from guys who wouldn't pay it. And one of them, we used one of them because what they did to get him to get pay was they put his uh, power of attorney on in, in the middle of a stack of papers he was signing. And he caught him. And we used that story in the, in the uh, or that storyline because uh, that was real to me. That's a guy dude, not, not paying a, uh, you know, you know, getting paid for your, your, your commissions. That's real. So, so I like that. I like stories that were, you know, and I believed. I, I didn't, and they would always pitch me, oh, else is going to make the biggest deal ever. I go, I don't give a shit about that. That's a number. The numbers are not emotional. You got to have a, don't give me, like Billy Wilder said, don't give me logic, give me emotion. You need emotion and characters. You don't need a number. Oh, it's going to be signed for 250 million. Eh, big deal. What's the difference to the viewer if it's 250 or 150 or 50? Eh, not, it's a number. You know, give me emotion. Now, if you tell me that Sandra O, oh, the character Rita, is going to, you know, forget the numbers, but if she makes, helps me out, she's going to get 50,000 frequent flyer miles, that's emotional. That's emotional. That's somebody to relate to. That's interesting. What, what don't, for, from the Arliss days, when, when, you, when you did talk to the agents, what surprised you the most? What was the one thing you did not expect? <laughs> the thing that was funny is they'd always say, look, I can't talk about this. It's totally off the record. I can't. And then they would rat each other, rat the clients out. <laughs> totally. Happened all the time. Happened all the time. But we would never, if we heard a story that we liked about what somebody did, we would never use the actual story. We would change the sport. You know, we would might even change the sex of the athlete mm -hmm. um, it, and twist it another way because we didn't want to be, we never, I never wanted to be on the nose. I wanted to do it a different way. Yeah, that makes sense. All of them. Oh, well, yeah, all of them I talked to. I, every, every, I, I, every one of them. Who's next? Somebody got a hand up? I'm going to ask you about, you mentioned him earlier, uh, well, you mentioned the movie earlier, uh, Good Morning Vietnam. Uh, talk about that experience and, you know, Robin Williams and, and what it was like working on Good Morning Vietnam. Oh, it was, it was heaven and it was hot. Um, we shot it in Bangkok. Now, you have to remember, Robin and I knew each other beforehand as comics. When I first started out around 1977, um, around in the 70, 77, 78, there was this buzz about this comic, Robin Williams, who could blow away rooms at three in the morning. In fact, Robin came through New York and we, I, I got to know him with the improv. And uh, so we got to know each other. We were friendly and, uh, you know, we hung out together. We partied together. Uh, so when, Rob, when I was cast, it was like I knew Robin. So it was, and so we got to hang out together in Bangkok a bit, a bit. And Robin was special. Robin was, Robin's heart was so big and he was so smart. And, you know, people say, was he on all the time? Absolutely not. Robin and I would just, you know, talk about stuff. And after, now he could go like this. You know, I mean, he could go from zero to hundred like that, but he was not, he was not on all the time. And uh, a lot of things about people didn't Robin didn't know. For example, um, Robin was a San Francisco comic. Each, you know, each town has their comics, you know. You could tell a Boston comic from a New York comic, from a San Francisco comic, it could back then. And in the early 80s, when Robin really explodes, Mork and Mindy and then everything else, early 80s in San Francisco, they get decimated by AIDS. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the comics they lost. And I know two or three comics that Robin supported under the table that nobody knew about, who, you know, how to have treatment and how to have stuff. And Robin was just so special. Just Robin was Robin Williams, very, very special guy. I miss Which Robin. Guy? Sweet guy. Uh, it looks like Ed has a question. Well, you, you inspire me with your stories about stand up, and, and I'm curious to know your origin story. When did you first think you were funny, and when did you first go on stage? I mean, you were part of a very short list of legendary comedians who transitioned to television and, and movies, of course. 
But what were those early years like for you? I, I Well, here's the thing is, I always wanted to be a filmmaker and a storyteller. I never thought of myself as a comedian or anything. I wanted to, you know, be behind the scenes making movies. But I had an acting background. I had a great theater department down in Houston. Uh, I had training. Uh, I always thought I was fun. I always thought I was funny. Even going back to, you know, my, I came from a funny family. My father was funny. My brother's funny. Um, so when I, and I studied comedy, when I say studied comedy, I, I studied comedy because that's what I love to watch. Um, my, my influences are everyone from, I mentioned Woody, but they're also, you know, everybody from Ernst Lubitsch to Kaufman and Hart to uh, Cary Grant to William Powell and Carol Lombard. And uh, I mean, my, and then, you know, Myrna Loy. And then of course the stand-up comics that I watched like Myron Cohn and Alan King. And so I watched everybody. So they're all influences me, especially, and then filmmaking, storytelling, all of that. So I, using Woody and Mel Brooks and Paul Mazursky as role models, they all started out of stand-up comics. And I thought, well, this is an interesting way to get people to see my humor, Elaine May, another one. Um, this is another way to see people see my humor so I can get a job because if I just have acting, I, I don't audition all that well. So this is a way I can get beyond that, cut through. And that's what happened. And of course, my first job was writing for Rodney Dangerfield. Rodney and I became friendly. And so I wrote for Rodney and Stiller and Mira. And then Rodney brought me out to California, which gave me a leg up on other comics. So, and that's when I got to go to the comedy store and the improv and I got seen and that's how I got Hollywood nights. And, um, and then that, that's how it started. Uh, I never thought I would be doing stand up full time. I never, even though I was doing well, I never thought of myself as a career stand up comic. Um, but it was great. And I great. that's very hard. Stand up comedy is really hard. Uh, and, uh, but that led to everything else. Is there any chance you'd do it again? Here's the thing. Yes, but here's the problem is the audience has changed. It's not that they've changed, it's that, that the audience got older. It's like, you know, look at all of us on this uh, Zoom thing, right? We're not the audience that go to comedy clubs for the most part. Um, and, and as my friend said, if you go and, and there's an older audience out there, they would rather spend, let's say, $100 to see Bill Maher than to go to a comedy club for $25 to see you. And that's true. That's my, you know, my friend Bobby Slayton, and you know, tells me all this time. It's just the audience is, you know, it, it's a very young audience, and that's that's just generational. Most things I think are generational. But um, I would, I'd like to do the history thing again, in some way. I enjoy doing that um, because I didn't have to do joke, 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 which you have to do if you're a stand-up, pretty much, unless you have a following and they know you. So that's I don't know if that's a good answer, but that's it. Sure. Um. I'm going to take a, a moment of privilege here and just thank you for making my life easier by asking really, really good questions because uh, this way I don't have to do any work. I just have to look at look and see if somebody would raise their hand. Um, anybody else want to got a got a question? Yes, Ashley. Once again, comes to my rescue. <laughs> You're welcome. I was just wondering what your favorite Mel Brooks movie is. And also, what were some of the names of some of those classic comedies that you love with Myrna Loy and Cary Grant and all of those? Because that's what I used to love watching too. So I'm just curious on those. First questions to producers. Okay. Um, the other ones, the favorite ones, His Girl Friday, of course. Yes. Uh, the Awful Truth. Yes. Um, my favorite movie to be or not to be the original one, not the Mel Brooks. I haven't seen that one. I haven't been able to find oh, it. Oh, with Jack, with Jack oh, Benny. Oh, it's on. It's on Turner Classic all the time. I don't have that channel. I used to, and I don't have it anymore. I grew up well, with that channel. To be able to find it, I mean, to be or not, okay. to be, the Ernst Lubitsch film is a masterpiece. It's a masterpiece. It's my favorite movie. It, and it, they it, almost it, did it. They almost did it shot film. for shot. They almost. I'm sorry. They almost did it shot for shot. Uh, no, no, that's psycho. That's that's not the Mel Brooks shot. <laughs> no. Mel Brooks is the Mel Brooks version of it. Yeah, okay. Um, the uh, that's my uh, charade. If I had to take a movie with me on a desert island, I'm taking charade. I love charade. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Um, what other movies? Uh, the awful truth. I met the Thin Man. All the mm -hmm. Thin. Mm -hmm. Love the Thin Such Man. Such good movie. dialogue. Uh, yeah, they knew how to do that. Um, yeah. Uh, I'm trying to think what other great comedies. Uh, one that cracks me up constantly in a different vein is Cat Baloo. I think Cat Baloo. <gasps> people forget that's like, Cat Baloo was nominated for an Oscar for screen. Yes, 
Also, and Lee Marvin also, won. Also uh, underrated movies and, and put down to the, are the great, great, great uh, Rock Hudson Doris Day movies. Yes. And Lover Come Back are brilliant. They're yes, brilliant. Send Me No Flowers is also very funny. Yeah, not as good as the other two. Not as good as the other also two. Also, The Thrill of It All is a good movie. That's written by Carl. Lover Come Back is my favorite of the three. Love the Thrill of It All with James brilliant. Garner and Doris Day, that yeah, was good. That's brilliant. Yes. Uh, what other comedies? Uh, off the top of my head. Um, Bob, I, like, was I, like, I like early Bob Hope movies before he started reading cue cards. Uh, <laughs> oh, and the Woody movies, of course. Woody, um, yeah. uh, what else? You know, again, the Cavalier was my family's favorite movie. My mom had it on VHS with that and the Good. Goonies. It was Good. those movies back to back. So we watched those all the time. Good. Love, love, love those films. Um, I'm trying to think who else. Uh, but I used to watch all the, uh, you know, the Irene Dunn movies are interesting. You know what's in good trouble is you don't want to find out too much about these people. It's like, yes. you, don't want to meet, you don't want to meet your heroes because you, yes. you get very disillusioned. Like Irene Dunn was a huge, uh, you know, anti-communist and she ratted out people name names. And, uh. stuff. and then you find that James Stewart was, was smuggling names to, to J. Go Hoover. Uh, like you don't want to no. find, you don't want to find out too much about these don't people. Don't tell me this stuff. Oh yeah, no. that's absolutely true. That's why Fonda and him didn't talk for for decades. Oh. Uh, they were best friends, and Fonda found out he was, you know, feeding the Hoover names. Uh, but you know, I can watch Jimmy Stewart forever. I can watch Cary Grant forever. Mm -hmm. uh, um, Philadelphia Story. Great movie. Great movie. Yeah. yeah. Have you seen um, Monkey Business with Cary Grant and Ginger? Yeah, Rogers? that's Joe Mankiewicz. That's a Joe Mankiewicz movie. Yes, that's of course. so funny. Yeah. I'm starting to Ashley. I'm starting to think that you you are much older than you look, and you've had amazing work done. No, oh. I've done any work done. Anything. <laughs> I had my scalp burned, so I have had that, but that's it. Um, no, no, and uh, I'm mean, older than I look. Well, yeah. No, I'm, I'm not kidding. No, I said Ashley talking is older to me. Than, I said Ashley is older than she looks. Oh, forty-one. No way. Mm -hmm. Nineteen eighty, no. February twenty-six, nineteen eighty. Well, you know, you know plenty. You 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 you've got, <laughs> well, you got the goods. Yeah, I grew did. up with it. Mm, Seriously, awesome. my mom would not let me watch anything after 9 p.m. but American movie classics when we were kids, or Nick at Night, which sure. is why I saw Happy Days and Dick Van Dyke Show and all I that. Worked, so. I worked for both those. I worked for. I did all the promos for AMC back in the 80s. All of them. Well, not I would have them, seen, I would have been watching that, yeah, in the late 80s, early through like 98, 99, when we couldn't do cable anymore. And then so. they changed. I, and, see and, some new, I see some new people in the room. Let's get to that. Yes, okay. let's go. Uh, uh, we got Steve and we got Danny. Danny, no. you, got a, you got a question? Yeah. Yeah, I got a, yes. Hi. Hi, Danny. Uh, nice to meet you, Robert. Um, Thank you. Uh, I am always a sucker, uh, two things. I'm always a sucker for any stories about Rodney. So if you have any Rodney stories, I'd love to hear them. And uh, I love the movie uh, Cobb. You know, any, uh, any of that. You're, you're hitting on two heartbeats here. Uh, Rodney, there was nobody like Rodney. Rodney was the hippest guy I ever met in my life. You know, people forget Rodney was of that group with Lenny Bruce. They were very tight and everything. And Rodney's the hippest guy I've ever met. Rodney, um, I met Rodney because when I was in college, he, I loved him. I was in the early 70s and me and my friend, we would, he would just, you know, the jokes, the jokes were just great. Rodney is an underappreciated comedy writer. People forget that, you know, a one-liner is a perfect form. It has a beginning, middle, and end. They're incredibly tough to write, but they are, they have a beginning, middle, and an end. And Rod, I knocked on, Rodney, I started writing for him. I just started doing stand-up comedy and I knock on his dressing room door. And if you know anything about Rodney, Rodney was sort of an exhibitionist. So he'd open the, you know, he'd never wear anything. He'd have a robe on and nothing underneath and he'd have it wide open. So, and, and but Rodney, I, I came in and uh, I tried, I, was, I got some jokes for you. And he was good about that. He'd like having young comics write jokes. And I said, I got some jokes. He goes, okay. I go, he goes, let me hear him. I go, <clears throat> okay, I'm all right now, but last week I was in rough shape. Guy come up to me at the airport. He says, well, we find out still payday. I say, when's payday? He says, I don't know. You got the job. Yeah, so he was, okay, the joke's a good kid, but don't do me. Don't do me. And so we started a relationship. And what was great is he trusted me as a comedy editor, uh, which I think I'm, that's, I think I'm pretty good at that, about, you know, eliminating words, moving stuff around. And so he, <laughs> damn about Rodney. Rodney would, Back in the days when you had, well, we still have uh, phone machines. Rodney would call me up 
leave a message on the phone, you try out a joke, and then would pause for the laugh on the phone. He would say, you know, oh, I'll tell you, I worked some tough George. You know, I worked at a place on the menu. They had broken leg of lamb. Okay, what do you think? Do you know, he would actually do that. So Rod, Rodney was the hippest, you know, it's like uh, nobody partied more than Rodney. Keith Richards couldn't keep up with Rodney. Rod, but Rodney was funny. Rodney was funny. What a legend. Oh, yeah. Yeah, he, would, he, he, was, he was something. And, and the cop. Oh, the cop well, happened because when we were doing Bull Durham, Ron and I were, were both fans of the Al Stump article that we both read 100 years ago about Ty Cobb's wild ride. He, in that, he talked about the night he spent, you know, going down the mountain with Ty Cobb. He became his biographer. And so we were both big fans of that. And Rodney and, and Ron saw this as heart of darkness. Here's this reporter going into this thing. And that was all Ron Shelton because he stuck up for me to give me the part. And uh, fortunately, Tommy Lee Jones was coming. Ron, uh, Ron did Bull Durham and then he did Blaze, which was did not do very well. But then he followed that up with White Men Can't Jump, which was a huge hit. And then Warner Brothers wanted to do it. They would do whatever he wanted to do. And it was Cobb. And they let him cast me. And it was going to be either Gene Hackman or Tommy Lee Jones. And Tommy Lee Jones had just done The Fugitive. And he'd done The Fugitive and uh, Under Siege for Warner Brothers. So they wanted to go with Tommy Lee Jones. And that's how that happened. But I love Cobb, but it's dark. It's dark. And I, I, I you know, it, it gave me a, a, you know, a lesson into how you know, people don't want to see dark movies for the most part. Thank you. Thanks. Steve. You look like you want to ask something, Steve. Uh, Steve Van Patten. Hey, uh, sorry guys, I'm I'm a little late, so uh, forgive me if this question was already covered. But I was curious at, at your time playing um, Arliss. Um, did any of the uh, sports figures that did their cameos? Did they surprise you with some acting ability oh, there. Good question. Well, here's the key. Don't, you don't, it's just because I guess there's a sports background too. Don't ask them to do something they're not capable of doing. Mm -hmm. You know, you don't want them to carry a scene. That's just stupid. Right. Uh, most, of, most of the time they were there for texture and relaxed. Here's the thing about the athletes. The more takes, most athletes are coachable, which means they take direction pretty well. Mm -hmm. And the more reps you give them, the better they're going to be. So on about take three, four, five, they're, they're starting to get it. You know, they're getting it. Mm -hmm. through. So don't ask them to do more than you can. Now, there are exceptions. The broadcasters, I expected more of. They're broadcasters, you know, constantly. Mm -hmm. well, they'd be friends. The, I would say the female athletes were better as a rule. They're, you know, uh, also, I had relationships with certain guys. Believe it or not, I'm friendly with Barry Bonds and Roger Clemens. So I could talk to them and say, okay, here's what we're going to do. And here's what I need. Like, Roger, don't tell you. Because the Yankees always wanted to see the script. And I'd never give it to them. Because Roger's going to close up a store. Same thing with David Wells. Mm -hmm. so, but the one that, there's a couple who are really good. But the one that we found out was Lincoln Kennedy, a defensive lineman, was a drama minor. We found this out. So I actually could give him some plot to carry. I could give him a little bit more. That was good. Oh, wow. Uh, by the way, oh, by the way, Danny, I'm sorry just to cut this off. A Cobb story, going back to you. I said the movie did not do well. It was too dark. Here's, an, uh, here's a story about that. I was playing in the, what was it called? The Lexus Challenge by Ray Floyd golf tournament. And it had major, I mean, they, they took me because Arliss was on, but it was like all A-list. It was Sean Connery and Clint Eastwood and Kevin Costner and Ken Griffey Jr. And it, it was like the A-list. So as it happens, but the thing about movie stars or TV stars or their own show, it, the great William Goldman, my, my, another one of my heroes, the screenwriter William Goldman, once wrote about movie stars that they are the same as you and me. They get dressed in the morning, they have breakfast, they brush their teeth, and they put their pants on one leg at a time. The only difference between them and you is from the time they wake up to the time they go to bed, no one ever tells them no. <laughs> so they all have their own point of view of the world. You know, okay, so I'm playing golf in the, in the 
uh, Lexus Challenge, and in my foursome is Sean Connery. And Connery, who I'm a huge fan of, but you know, he's got, he's, they, all these guys got their point of view and the ego. So we're walking down the first fairway and Connery says, you were in that movie Cobb, weren't you? I said, yes, I was. He goes, now Cobb was a huge failure, bomb, big time. And he says, I'll tell you why that movie didn't do well. And I said, okay, I'm, I'm listening. He says, because it showed what it takes to be great. And Americans don't want to see what it really takes to be great. I took that in a second and I said, okay, okay, Sean, but you should know it bombed in the UK too. <laughs> so he, then he gave a big hurrah, and he didn't talk to me much after that. I mean, but that's what I remember about Cobb and Connery. That's a great story. <laughs> Thank you. That's great. That's cool. Okay, we just have a few more minutes. So if you have a question, now is your chance. Uh, we haven't heard from SK. We haven't heard from Miriam. Um, so if you have any questions, you, now's your chance. And Steve Van Patten is drinking. So that's good. Uh, this is Steve Kugelmas, you, do you have a question? You, I saw you raise your hand. Oh, I raised my hand too. Oh, you raised your hand too. Okay, well, first Steve and then Sue, and then I think we're gonna wrap it up after that. Is my mic live? Your mic is live, now live. Good, yeah. thank you. Robert, nice to meet you. Thanks for sharing your evening with us. Really a pleasure. So you had mentioned at the very beginning of, of, the, of the evening with us, you talked about how um, some of the directors you worked with were very engaged and beat you up all the time and really, uh, you know, really uh, made you do your best work. Well, Barry Primus, I was talking oh, about. Oh, okay, Barry, Barry Primus. Um, do you prefer that or do you prefer directors that give you more space and let you, you know, let you uh, walk the walk? Good, good question. Uh, do I prefer that? I think well, Barry had a definite vision, like both. I mean, you know, I, you know, with Barry Levinson, you're going to have all the freedom you want. With with Tim Burton, he let me go a little way. Ron let me go, and but Barry, he had a, he had lived this thing. I was I was playing Barry Price, so. It, it was, you know, he said something to me, as, you know, again, he's big time actor studio and I learned so much. I'm a better, I became a better actor, at least in that. Um, one thing I'll never forget him telling me is about this would be filmmaker that you never had, a, you know, he was reduced to doing, you know, industrial stuff. And he said, one thing, Robert, you, you, you've been pretty successful. He says, this character has not been successful. You have to embrace failure. And I thought, he goes, you, you, that's not in you. You have to pull that out. So I thought that was a great piece of direction. And I hope, you know, uh, that he brought that out of me. It's like, yeah, you've been beaten up here. Um, you know, that's why, do I prefer, uh, you know, I prefer a great script. <laughs> you know, it's like, uh, yeah, great director is wonderful. And yeah, it sure is. But give me the script. So if it ain't on the page, it ain't on the stage. Um, you know, I'd rather have a lesser director with a better script, you know, most of the time. Uh, but give me the script. We have a, a newcomer has entered the room. Oh, geez, talking about the Look at that cameo. <laughs> Say hi, Don. You're muted. You're on mute. You're on mute. All right, how, how about this? There you now? go. There you go. Yeah. The technology's great, isn't it? Hey. Ladies and gentlemen, Don Most. Star hey, Robert. Happy how you doing, Don? Good, how are you doing, buddy? I'm fine, I'm fine, thanks. I'm glad, glad. how's your wife? She's okay, how's yours? It's okay. Yeah? yeah. I'll well, talk to we you need, We need to, okay. We need to do the Sunshine Boys again somewhere. I, I loved it. I, I, you know, I look back at it. We only did like four performances, four or five. And it was a shame because at the end, we were really starting, I thought, to find something there. And, yeah. Def uh, oh, definitely. Yeah, Don, I and I, Don and I did the Sunshine Boys together down in Pinehurst, North Carolina. Yeah. And uh, had a good, Don played uh, Pinehurst, of course, a couple of times. But we had a great time. Um, oh, my God. It was wonderful. Yeah, we we should do that again. So we have to figure out 
you know, where and who to put that together and all, because we were really good together. Yeah, I would agree. I mean, uh, I mean, Gary Marshall still have his theater over there? I think, well, he does, he's not up here. Oh yeah, yeah, the Falcon, Falcon. Theater. Well, Falcon. it's called the Gary Marshall Theater now. Yeah, we, we could talk to them. Yeah. I, did, I did a Neil Simon play there. Like uh, I ought to be in pictures. So I think maybe that would, that would be great. Uh, I, would, oh. I, would, I would do it again in a second, in a heartbeat. Yeah, me too. Me too. Well, that's great. Well, you did a play there, so we should. Well, yeah, I'll talk to uh, you could talk to whoever you know, and I'll talk to whoever I know, and maybe we can make it happen. No, I'd love that. That's so, good. So, so Don and Anson, Don brought Robert into our viral vignettes, and the two of them did I think it was the second one we shot and the first yes. one that we premiered, uh, yeah. which which was Old Buddies. And it was really, they were both terrific. It was just so much fun to do it with them. And it was so easy. And and Mr. Wool nailed it in, in two takes. Yes, uh, yes, he did. Yes. He, yeah, we didn't do, we, we didn't do any rehearsal on that. It was fun. Robert, you know, I think we both decided, no, we, you know, let's not rehearse this. Let's just you know the script was really good let's let's just do it goes back to what i said give me the script give me the better yeah. script. you know that would be yeah. that always yeah it's always as as the play's the thing somebody said something like yeah, that somebody once said that so much yeah. <laughs> it was shakespeare but you know about him what has he done lately nothing <laughs> no, <laughs> i hear he has a movie out he's got a new movie out that i heard i hear good things i hear it's the same thing he's done over and over this is i got the, this is the, you know it's funny you say that i got into this discussion about west side story and uh i really enjoyed the movie but i could but be before it came out now there is no musical I, I would think between my two favorite musical movie musicals are probably west side story and singing in the rain mm -hmm. so they're they're in a place up there but i could not understand the vitriol that because they were making another version of west side story that people were having i just could not understand I go, you know years ago i told people years ago there was this play that did really well when it first opened called macbeth and it, it, you know and since that time there's been a bunch of versions some of which have been pretty good why is everybody so pissed off about west side story yeah, right. and and uh, you know, and I thought I, I enjoyed the movie. It's not it's not Jerome Robbins. It's a different animal. So what? Just those mm. songs to hear those music when you hear musical you you know after watching Dear Evan Hansen and then hearing West Side Story. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> you know, so, it was so beautifully recorded. Excuse also. me. Yeah, absolutely. I yeah, I, I haven't like seen. I, I have to see. I haven't seen the movie yet. I'm very. It's worth seeing. It's definitely worth seeing. Oh, don't I'm tell him. To. Don't tell him how it ends. Yeah, no. <laughs> I'm done. Anyway, it ends differently than you think. Oh yeah. It does actually. Music, musically. Yes. Yes. And that was one of the few mistakes I didn't like. I that annoyed me. That yeah, annoyed me. Yeah. 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 But, but otherwise, it, it's you know it's done with just the it's the song. It's like when I went to see the revival of Company. I happened to go the day after Sondheim died. So you can imagine what the energy in the theater was like. Oh my but God. The songs, you know, oh it's like God. the songs, the music. And West Side Story, I felt the same way. It's just a different interpretation of it. Yeah. And, and it's, and it's, you know, I, I felt like I liked portions of it. Uh, as a whole, I think I stick with the old one, but I don't know. That's if that's not, of course, you're going to stick with. That's not the point. I don't think if it's, but I don't think if it's a, it, I don't know if it's a bias or if it's a thing. But they made legitimate choices. They just made different choices. Right, and and, and it's not Jerome Robbins. I mean, let's get yes. that straight. Yep. Yep. Uh, but again, you know, the song. If you can, if you can expose those songs to a younger generation, what is wrong with that? I, you know. I, Absolutely. I, oh, yeah. Yeah. I and, mean, and I, by the way, it was Bernstein, as interpreted by the New York Philharmonic, did the music, which is the only way to hear Bernstein, as far as I'm concerned. Oh, by the way, you should know Bernstein and Sondheim and, and Arthur Lawrence did not like the original movie. So, I, you know, it's like they're wrong. <laughs> But they didn't like it, so you know who. You know there you go. And the Kushner screenplay is really interesting. He made some great choices there. The way they flesh out the character of of, of Riff and of uh, uh, and, and it's also Chino. 
Chino's character is interesting better. Um, and anybody's. And anybody's, that's right, yes. So those choices were great. But the Krupke is terrific. Um, the somewhere thing we'll argue with another dog because that's another thing. Uh, but, we could we could talk about that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I mean, that's worth. It's absolutely worth seeing. Worth seeing. I enjoyed it. Um, I'm it, going to see it. I'm going. Yeah, to watch God, it. you should. You really should. I'm definitely going to. It's it. worth nope. seeing. Oh, I'm sure. I'm sure. I mean, come on, Spielberg. Uh, you know, okay, there could be differences, you know, of opinion about all kinds of things, but I know it's going to be, it's got to be brilliant in, in some respect. It, it is, it was, and it is. Yeah, it's got to it be. Is. Yeah. yeah, and it is. I mean, they make choices, some you agree with, some you don't. I mean, I just saw a company on Broadway when they did the gender switch, you know, the, the, uh, the, mm -hmm. the gender switch, and I don't know how much it worked. I, I, some of it did, some of it didn't for me, but it's, yeah. it's still the songs, it's, it's company. You know, company was never about the book. You know, it was dated when it first came out. <laughs> it was, it was dated, I think it came out in what, 72? So by, so by 73 it was dated. The, um, <laughs> it was, I mean, if you did, you know. So, uh, and they well, did people, oh, I'm sorry, but be, before the, the time runs out, I want people who are here. Yeah, to, does anybody to have questions for the two of these guys? Um, yeah, but, and I know I, just, to to say, I want them to check. Oh, they can check out our our vignette. That's going. It will be going up in the next day or two. I, so, yeah, somebody, somebody asked him how difficult I was to work with. <laughs> how difficult I was to work that with. That was the question somebody asked. No, no, somebody should. How difficult <laughs> were you to work with? <laughs> You were a dream. You were prepared. Some oh people were, was, you know, was, you were both. No, prepared. ask Don. It, no, I don't think Don found. I don't think Don found me difficult. I, director might uh, have a different point of view. No, no. Yeah, you were not difficult at all. And and I can't. I don't think the director of the play that we did and David uh, with the vignette we did found you difficult. I can't no, imagine. No, no, no. No, we were done. We were done in 35 minutes. Are you kidding me? I've never shot anything so fast in my whole life. That's, that's I, was... I mean, the last 20 minutes was just talking like this. I mean, it was just so I, I, was, I got I got interviewed yesterday by someone who was asking me about the viral vignettes. And he asked me how many days each one took to shoot. I'm like, days? Yeah. I'm like, I had these guys for an hour or two if <laughs> I was lucky, you know, and and because, well, not that everybody was busy during March and April of 2020, but you, know, uh, Before, you talked about, you know, we were talking about Marty Landau, we're talking about certain people, and it's comedy, you know, comedy is comedy's a different animal. Uh, but I'll, I'll never forget the story Martin Landau told me about, we were talking about comedy, and he was talking about Gregory Peck. He said, Great guy, don't let, him near, don't let him near a comedy. He, he, he goes, don't let him near a, a, a comedy. He said he, he was doing Pork Chop Hill in 1959, one of Marty's first films. And um, it was, you know, it's a big war movie. And it, 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 there's a scene, it's being directed by Lewis Millstone, who was directing his first war movie since All Quiet on the Western Front. Wow. So, yeah. So they have this scene and all this, they're, it's, they're setting up this huge battle scene, but also all the soldiers, the actors in a ditch, they're in, you know, a ditch, you know, one of the, they've dug a ditch and they've got about an hour to kill. And Marty goes over to Greg and goes, Greg, do you know that 70% uh, of all degenerates are hard of hearing? And Greg says, what? He goes, hard of hearing, hard of hearing. <laughs> okay. So Greg goes, Peck goes, <laughs> good one, good one. And he says, then I watch Peck for the next half hour, rehearsing the scene, the joke I just told him. And finally he gets up enough, he's got it down and he goes up to the director, Millstone, who's lining up this enormous battle shot and he feels Peck on his shoulder and he goes, Greg, is something the matter? And he goes, Millie, did you know that 70% of all degenerates are hard of hearing? Shit, and he walks away. And he says, Greg Peck, great guy. Don't let him near a comedy. <laughs> so, you know, you know, so 
put this one. Although he was good, he was he was good in a light comedy like uh, Roman Holiday. But um, yeah. Yeah, yeah, but but, but that's that's that again, I guess. there are some people you just. It's like I saw this Billy Crystal movie recently with Tiffany Haddish, and he plays a Saturday Night Live writer, and he's got one of the guys who puts the accent, the actors, on the wrong syllables of the joke every time. And it drives me fucking crazy. And I said, I've been there. I've been there. You know, I, I see the app and I see that. <laughs> uh, Sue, you had a question before uh, Don showed up. Do you want to, and, and I know that it was for a friend of yours. Do you want to ask it? It's a super quick question, but it's, it's a fun setup too. Um, this friend couldn't be here tonight because he lost his job as a corporate chef during COVID. So he opened a food truck and his food truck today was in Union, New Jersey. Ah! So first he wants you to know that you're still represented in the Hall of Fame. Yeah, I'm, I, that's my hometown, Union, New Jersey. He's a huge fan and his- What, what kind of food truck is it? Soup, it's all soup. It's called the Soup loves, Phantom. I love soup, I would love to go there. Soup phantom on instagram and facebook and find out where he is but he's that whole area uh, so but three comics three comics have come out of three very good comics have come out of union new jersey um i, I was the first one and then uh, jeff ross who's always on the roast is from union and artie lang is also wow from didn't really yeah. did not realize that so anthony aka the soup phantom his question is in Batman, was asking Bruce Wayne for a grant something you improvised? No. Okay. No, it's in the script. That was in the script. Now, the other line, uh, the King of the Wicker People, that was improvised. Uh, that was improvised, and there was another line. I think they let me do, there's another line. But no, uh, can I have a grant? That was, in, that was in the script. A very good script. Like I said, every, like I said, if you put the first if you put the first five Batmans, that's the first hour. First hour of the first Batman, you put them all together, every hour gets progressively worse. <laughs> that was Sam Hamm who wrote that, right? Sam Hamm wrote the original script, that, and it was a great script. And then Warren Scarron came in to do a polish on it, and he did great work. And Warren Scarron? But Warren Scarron, he actually died. He was a young guy. Not related, not related to Bill Scarron. That's Scarron. It's a Scarron. Okay, okay. Bill Scarron, no. The uh, the uh, no, but Warren Scarring was a great guy. In fact, he gets called in halfway through the shooting. He couldn't understand why, and they decided to rewrite the ending. That you know, they go up to the church steeple or whatever it was on the high thing where they have this big, and that only came about because John Peters and Jack Nicholson went to see. Remember, this is thirty years, thirty five years ago. They went to see Phantom of the Opera. Uh, and when it was for hottest ticket in, in London, and Jack says, "That's what we need in our picture." And so he kicked, that's how that whole thing happened. Tim didn't know what the hell hit him. Now Tim Burton is not Tim Burton at that point. You got to remember. Yeah, he didn't have the clout, you know. So right. Uh, oh. Yeah, but uh, Tim is an artist. I mean, how was he to work with as, uh, as an as an actor? Because it seems like so much of him is vested in the look and the art and the art and those incredible designs of oh, Gotham true. City and everything. No, yeah. oh, that's, that's Tim. That's Tim, that's Tim's strength, he's visual. Tim will be the first time, he don't know narrative. He'll be the first one to say, I don't know story that well. Um, but it's a visual design, it's, he, he is an artist. Um, yeah. I mean, and, and along with the other person who gets credit and he's not long, he died, he killed himself, was uh, the uh, was the production designer? Oh, why am I drawing a blank? Uh, what's his name? I know who you're talking about. Yeah, uh, he killed himself right afterwards. Anton first. Yeah. Anton for brilliant. I mean, the, when you used to go to Pinewood and see Gotham City, nobody ever saw anything like that before. It was really cool. It was really cool. Uh, yeah, every now and then I would go. They DC Comics and Danny, maybe you remember this. DC Comics had the original um design work framed on the walls in oh. their lobby of all his his work and it oh was yeah it was brilliant. Uh, actually sam was probably in those offices more do you remember that sam sam you gotta unmute unmute yourself sam there we go you can hear me now yeah, yeah. okay yeah uh well joe orlando was the liaison uh, as I understand it, for the production. And I know he had a lot of first sketches in his office. And then I think later they put them on the walls outside in the hallway. 
Yeah, just beautiful. I, I, I sometimes I would come in and just look at them and just stare at them for hours. Well, they were impressive, yeah. Then those those became the look and feel of the comics after that. Yeah, that's yeah. true. Yeah. That's yeah, true. That's Tim Burton, though. It was like Tim Burton, like I said, and Anton first. They were the look of it, but it was Tim Burton. Tim Burton. Mm. Just... Robert, before we start wrapping up, what are you what are you uh, working on now? Not too much. I gotta <laughs> tell you. I mean, everybody tells me what they're working on. I'm not doing much. Uh, I, you know, I'm I'm sort of retired until somebody offers me a job. The uh, yeah. the I, I I do writing. I do I, I stay and I will tell. I'm writing down my stories. You know about growing up. About what a lot of what we just discussed today. We do do that, and uh, I look. I'll forward send to you a transcript that'll make it easier. <laughs> you know the uh, uh, and I look forward to baseball season a lot. And I, I enjoy, and I'm, the other thing is I'm enjoying being a great audience. I always remembered my teacher saying, if you can't be a great actor, be a great audience. And so I've always believed in that. Uh, but, you know, again, um, you know, when you get, you know, you get to be, you know, of a certain age, they're not looking for you, you know? So if something happens, I would have to be like an assume the position type of thing that comes along, which I would love to do. But again, but they're not, you know, you, I, you know, it's generational. It's, it's a whole, that's just the way it is. And, um, you know, if something comes along and they want to use me, I mean, that's fine. I'm very excited about that. I tried to, I'd love to work with young filmmakers and I just did a, a, a short film. Uh, well, no, it's not a short film, but a short part of the film. And I loved it. But again, you know, they're not, you know, you know it's, they're just not looking for you. You know, it's just an age thing. And it, that's unfortunate, but it's true. Let's get you and Don up on stage again. And Don, what do you, Don, you're busy as a, you're, well, I wish it was Dan Rather, so I had to go, you're busy as something, but what, what are you up to these days? Well, um, I just came back from Orlando. I, I was doing a, a show at a performing arts center, you know, singing, doing my singing thing. Um, it was the Claremont uh, Performing Arts Center, and I had a great time. And uh, right before that, I was doing a play in, uh, Carl Gable's Miami called Middletown. And um, now coming up, at, like Robert, I, I'm not sure. I'm not sure what, what's coming up next. There's talks about me doing a tour in Italy with my music. Happy and, Grace. Yeah, and also, yeah, because Happy Days was very big in Italy. Well, and, um, and maybe Australia, New Zealand tour. So we'll see if that happens. And, um, and I'm attached. Robert, you would appreciate this. I'm attached to direct a movie about the life of the legendary baseball player, Tommy John. Oh, really? That's interesting. And it's a great story. Tommy's Tommy, life is, yeah, it's a great Tommy. story. So um, we're getting closer and closer and uh, that would be fantastic. And also um, another film that I just recently got attached to direct. Uh, which I can't talk about, but um, so I'm hoping I haven't done that in a while. You know, it's been I, I've done three films, uh, independent films directing, but it's been too long. So I'm hoping some of these come together. I'd like to get behind the camera again. If you've um, never heard, by the way, if you've, anybody out there who's never heard Don sing, um, he, he's quite wonderful. I, you know, we, it was great backstage. We would be singing all the time. You remember the dressing room? We would sing songs. Right. Do we do? <laughs> but I got to tell you how loyal a friend, see, loyalty is a big deal with me. I mean, that's a yeah. big thing with me. This is how loyal a friend I am to this guy. Yes. Well, you know the story here. We're, yeah. we're wrapping up production. We're wrapping up the Sunshine Boys. And I'm living in New York in my apartment. And Don says, I'm going to be in New York on October 2nd. I'm singing at this club. And I said, I'm there. And I said, I'm there for you. Mm. The day before. On October 1st, a buddy of mine comes into town and says, I got two front, I got two uh, house seats for Springsteen on Broadway. You want to go with me? <laughs> I said, I sure do, but I can't. Oh, and he says, God. I'm going to see Don Most <laughs> sing in this tiny club. And he says, would you say that again? You're going to give up Springsteen on Broadway house seats Right. See Don most sing. And I said, yeah, I am. <laughs> and I have to say to that day, that decision has haunted me. I know it's haunting me. <laughs> yeah, as well it should. 
the uh, because it's haunting me. Didn't, Springsteen didn't give up his seats to go see you. <laughs> yeah, I'm still feeling rather bad about that. He's going to bring this up for the rest of your life, Don. <laughs> yeah. Yes, indeed. <laughs> I, I guess we'll have to. I'll have to find some good seats for a Springsteen concert some some day soon. <laughs> you know, we'll go together. We'll go together. Uh, I, I, you know, look, I don't know what about other people because like, like, uh, like Richard Gere, I got nowhere to go. But I just wanted to thank everybody here for uh, popping in. Robert, thank you for your time and your wonderful, amazing stories and, and your graciousness. Don, thank you for coming in to say yes, hi. Don, thank you. Thank all of you. Don, sure. in, by the way, he left thank the you. Springsteen concert in the middle to be here. Right. Tonight. Um, so so thank I, you for leaving Springsteen. And yeah. and everybody else, thank you. Thank you for, for you know pitching in on uh, viral vignettes. Uh, we are posting uh, the, the festival versions of them every day. We're getting into new festivals every day with uh, Don, I think Harvest Time was uh, accepted to a festival uh, today. Oh yeah. So, so it's just another, it's just another it's just another Thursday. All right. Well, you'll tell me which one. I'll tell you about it. And okay. and everybody else, thanks. I really I really do appreciate all of this.